Grandmama used to pray, oh Lord, please save them from the evil snares and all the dangers that entangle. Yeah, though they walk in through the valley of the shadows, just prepare and make them fit for every battle because, but I know they're bound to come and I know they're bound to fall. But in your bounty, Lord, preserve their beautiful home. Right. We still survive and offer grandma's prayers. Surrounded by the jungle and the lion's den. Tread light, cause these traps is inconspicuous. They hide right in plain sight. Thinking we don't see them when they linger. Look right beneath the surface. Then leave a trail of corpses. Crisis, prices, your life a disposable commodity. Like living in a fantasy condition to believe that the system even cares. Whether selling CDs or walking or driving or reading. Look, they don't even need a reason. It's just your breathing and being black. When it's such a pretty fall, a pretty fall It don't seem like we falling at all, at all It's just a GMO dream Where things are never really what they seem Please kill the violins Tell them just to play me something pretty Cause this pretty city got me screaming bloody murder So they got me screaming This pretty city got me Got me on song, look, get your hand up on my pocket, distraction, so lazy they use the same tactics, like kind them with some trinkets, just don't let them get to thinking, that light bulb gets a blinking, you know niggas and ideas, oh dear, my dear, my dear, you may not know me, but I know you very well, for sight, for sight, they say hindsight is 2020, well tell me something, we gotta see that history is on repeat, and maybe it takes the beat and the melody to speak a little louder than the message in the clouds, or the essence in the air i swear my god is just so clear that a system driven by fear can never give us nothing but more of the same things things oh when it's such a pretty fall a pretty fall it don't seem like we've fallen at all it's just a gmo dream but things are never really what they seem please to the violins tell them just to play me something pretty because this gritty city got me screaming it's murder Got me screaming, got me This gritty city got me, got me on song What's happening, good people? What's the deal? We are live and direct. This is RSTV, your favorite platform. Excuse me, your favorite show on the platform. And one of the dopest joints around, we already know that. So, you know, just, you know, feel good, feel the vibe, feel the energy. Um, I am broadcasting today uh, from Parts Unknown. Shout out to Bill Keats and uh, Suleiman in the sanctuary. You know what I'm saying? For having me over here today. Um, shout out to my sponsor, Gorilla Republic, for doing what they do. Um, if it's your first time tapping into Black Power Media, welcome. Um, it's the... the blackest platform on YouTube where you can catch everyone from veteran members of the Black Panther Party, Cornell West, Mark Lamont Hill, Angela Davis, whoever. Uh, if you missed the last episode of RSTV's Real Dope Piece we did with uh, Dream Hampton, Dream Hampton, who we know is a, uh, uh, a hip hop, one of the most powerful sisters I would say in hip hop, and to keep that uh, momentum going, I wanted to bring someone who um, I have admired from afar uh, based on work ethic, bravery, you know, and her contribution to um, to our culture. You know, um, it's funny because I know about her mother before I know about her. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, again, welcome to RSTV. Hit that like button, share all that good stuff that they say on YouTube. And um you know, without further ado, uh, I'm going to introduce you introduce to you in a couple seconds, uh, Drew Dixon. If you're unfamiliar with Drew Dixon, Drew Dixon is a producer, a writer, activist, entrepreneur. Uh, she's a former a &R exec. She's responsible. She put a imprint, a fingerprint on some of uh, some real dope music, including uh, American Boy by Estelle uh, Kanye West. We know about her work with uh, Method Man and, and Mary J. Blige. For those of you who have watched, um, what was the show? I don't know why I'm so nervous today. <clears throat> um, Ladies First, Women in Hip Hop. She talked about that in that particular project. Um, there's also a project that, um, that was released in May of 2020 on HBO Max 
talking about um, this cat, Russell Simmons. You know what I mean? Someone who we looked at for years. Someone who, uh, for me, was one of the reasons I went into the whole music industry side of things. Um, someone that during the 80s helped us to help kind of shake the culture of hip hop. But like others, you know, who were exposed before him, uh, Africa Bambada, folks like that, you know, they kind of tainted what was going on. And this particular sister here, you know, she highlights that in that particular documentary. And she's also a uh, documentary uh, called On the Record. And she's also been, um, has become an advocate against sexual violence, rape, et cetera. I want to welcome to our platform today, Drew Dixon. Drew, Hi. what's happening? How you feeling? I'm good. I'm grateful to be here. Honored, you know, to be invited and, and looking forward to our conversation. Thank you so much. No doubt. The honor is ours. Um, I appreciate you taking time out of your schedule. We know you're on a world tour with Mr. Malcolm McLaren. You know what I'm saying? And, and try to do your thing. But, you know, we're glad that you stopped through the rock with us. today. You know? For sure. Happy to be here. No doubt. For our audience, um, Miss Sharon Pratt, uh, the mother of Drew, Drew Dixon, uh, Sharon Pratt Dixon, uh, the first woman mayor of first Washington, black female mayor. Of a yes, city. first black female mayor of Washington, D.C. Of any major city. I'm going to show any my mama real quick. <laughs> hey, that's right. That's right. But our, our audience would know her because, um, you know, my big brother uh, was on a show with her on Donahue back in the day. Okay. Ruba Ben Wahad, along yeah. with uh, Cornell West, Sister Soldier, and, and others. You know, she represented, uh, you know, her city. And that particular show became a, I guess we would call it an iconic uh, moment in TV history. Yeah. You know, so we wanted to uh, shout her out. But yeah, welcome to the platform, as I stated. Thank you for having me. Thank you for creating this platform for these important conversations and to you know, amplify stories that are important to us that don't necessarily get seen and heard elsewhere. Thank you no, so much. No doubt. For folks who are unfamiliar, that's been on the rock and... Um, you know, don't really follow hip hop like that. You know, give us a little backstory about who Drew Dixon is uh, before the hip hop or before music. And, uh, you know, up until now, if you don't mind. Not at all. So, yep, I grew up in DC, like you said. Um, I grew up as the daughter of two black politicians. My father was a city councilman, chairman of the city council. My mother was the first black female mayor of a major city. And I worked on all those campaigns, knocked on all those doors and grew up with a real sort of spirit of service and commitment to my people. When I grew up, DC was an 80% black city. And my parents were very much part of getting locally elected government in DC in the first place. And so I grew up with this sort of commitment to empowering our people and holding on to DC and more broadly our rights and, and you know what we were entitled to as people in this country that we built. And so then I went to Stanford. I decided to go to school 3000 miles away from where I grew up because I wanted to spread my wings and get my own footing. And I was really, inspired there to be a risk taker. It was the home of sort of the dot-com boom before the dot-com boom. But I don't think if I had not gone to Stanford, I necessarily would have found the sort of confidence to come to New York in 1992 and start answering phones at Jive Records and then later Warner Brothers Records because I wanted to make rap records. I thought that hip hop was gonna change the world. And I believed in putting the microphone in the hands of as many young black geniuses as I possibly could. And that's why I wanted to do a &R, And that is eventually what I was able to do in New York City as an a &R person. No doubt. I mean, you didn't just do a and I mean, you, 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 were, you was A&R. You know what I'm saying? And for folks who aren't familiar with uh, a and artists and repertoire, you were one of, um, I would say, one of the most important uh, mm -hmm. A&R of that particular time and pretty much of, um, of of music right now because, you know, nowadays, I don't know what a and is on. I mean, it's like, you know, sign anybody or whatever goes. But, yeah. you know, you come from an era when hip hop was, you know, it was really taking shape and taking form when you talk about the 90s. Tell us about some of the artists that you uh, you worked with. Yes. Well, first of all, thank you for what you said about a and because it definitely has changed. It's an old school term. It stands for artists and repertoire. 
it comes from the 50s when you signed artists like you know Frank Sinatra or Ella Fitzgerald and then you found their repertoire of songs but it stuck in the rock and roll era when artists wrote their own music and in the hip hop era when artists were largely self-contained. But back when I did A&R, you had to have ears, not an algorithm. You really had to listen and believe you heard something that had the potential to become a hit or see an artist had the, that had the potential to become a star. So my first A&R job, well, before I got my A&R job, my first job not answering phones was at Zamba Music Publishing where I signed Nas to a publishing deal a couple months either before or after he dropped Illmatic. So that's now an iconic album, but I signed him to his publishing before we knew it would become iconic. I signed Eric Sermon to a publishing deal as a producer at Zamba. And then I went to Def Jam to start what at the time I thought was my dream job, reporting to Russell Simmons, who I admired just like so many of us as somebody who was putting hip hop on the map and who was also creating black wealth which back then I believed was gonna save us, but I won't get into that right away about how that was a little bit of a head fake for us because capitalism is a little bit of a trap. But at the time I thought black wealth would save us and I was really inspired by Russell Simmons in that way. So I reported to him directly and as is documented in Ladies First and on the record, the two documentaries that I appear in, I heard an interlude that now it's like a song in the album, but just to be clear, when I heard it, it was not a track. There was no All I Need on Takao, Method Man's album. I was just compiling the paperwork, putting a rubber band around it and making sure it matched the tape that I was given. And when I heard the interlude, Shorty, I'm there for you anytime you need me, for real girl to me, you will believe me. I lost my mind. I insisted that it had to become a song. I suggested that they put Mary J. Blige on it. And eventually, I won't tell the story again because it's already in the documentaries. Russell let me try it. My suggestion was we call it a remix, put it on the back of the second single, and it went on to win Def Jam its first Grammy. So I'm very proud of that. I loved it because I thought it was a reflection of Black love. I happen to believe to this day that the cheat code for Black liberation is Black men and Black women sticking together and having reciprocity. I'm convinced of that. I believe that in my spirit at 23 years old when I heard that interlude, I believe it now. I'm not sure it's gonna happen in my lifetime anymore, but I still do believe that is the cheat code. I still believe that is why they had a condemned cell in the transatlantic slave trade where black men who defended the black women from being violated were taken to die. I believe that condemned cell is where they locked up our whole entire power. And if we can stand together, we are going to win and we have to stand together because we can't afford not to, but I digress. I worked on that record. Then I worked on another record called The Show Soundtrack, where I just called all my favorite rappers from around the country to represent what I thought was kind of the state of the art of hip hop in 1994. I called Bone Thugs and Harmony. I got a Tupac record. I got a Biggie record. I got a Tribe record. I got Warren G and the Dub Shack. And I'm very proud of that record too. It became a hit, but I left Def Jam because I was assaulted by Russell Simmons when that record was still in the top 10, maybe even the top five of the R&B chart. I was devastated. I never expected that. He had been inappropriate with me in terms of his language and behavior, but it was always kind of a thing where he would do it and then apologize and do it and apologize. So in my mind, I was naive. I didn't understand grooming. I didn't understand any of that then. I was so focused on my goal and I was focused on black liberation and I hadn't really thought of sort of my vulnerability as a woman, right? I, I wasn't, I saw feminism as a white lady thing and I have very big issues with white feminism, but I didn't understand that I needed to maybe think about that piece too, because I was this vulnerable woman in this environment. And so I quit my job after that happened. I was devastated, but then I went to Arista Records. I reported to Clive Davis, where I called a lot of my hip hop friends like Lauren Hill, who gave me a rose is still a rose for Aretha Franklin. Wyclef gave me Maria Maria for Carlos Santana. Wyclef gave me My Love Is Your Love for Whitney Houston. Montel Jordan, a friend of mine from Def Jam, gave me Nobody's Supposed to Be Here for Deborah Cox. I signed Q-Tip to a solo deal. I signed Brand Newbie and we did the Foundation album, their reunion album, trying to represent up in Arista with a very, very black record, a very empowered record. And then I went on later to run John Legend's label and it was my idea to call Kanye West and put him an American boy. So. Very proud of the records I helped to make, heartbroken that I had to leave the industry because I was 
inappropriately treated to put it mildly. Sorry, my kids ordered food. So <laughs> good, so good. And so that's kind of my story as an a person. And I left the business and kind of just became a mom for 15 years. Hey, Drew, I mean, you know, you just hit me with like so much at one time. You know what I'm saying? You just like folks that was talking about, I ain't never heard of him. Don't even worry about what you heard about. Don't even worry about what you heard. Get a late pass. We here today. You know what I'm saying? They, they know now. Um, man, I mean, I don't even, I mean, first of all, you started with the transatlantic slave trade and that just messed a whole lot of folks up because a lot of times we have folks on here and they just think that, uh, well, they're going to talk about this and they don't necessarily know about that. And they think if you come from a certain, uh, environment or from a certain background or whatever, they'll try to peg you and say, okay, well, you know, you were raised with a silver spoon or whatever. So you just got on. You know what I'm saying? It was just a, a pretty face in a high place. So you was able to eat, you know what I mean? But you just right. smoked them up real quick, rolled them up. And, um, you know, that, that, that's, that, that's wild. I want to ask you real quick because it's like so many different points that you, you opened up so many windows. Um, the show soundtrack, I'm trying to think, uh, was Isaac to Isaac on that track that, that, um, wow. That gosh. I, mm. Were they? I don't know that they were. Okay. I'm trying to okay. think. The single was How High, Meth and okay. Red. Right, that was right, the right, single. Right. Okay. I, okay. I, gosh, that's taking me back. I'd have to look at the track listing. It, it, it's all good. I mean, I know they weren't, you know, some of your your top. <laughs> I remember that name. Yeah. So that makes me think that they might have been. Gosh, it's, okay. it's okay. been a while. Okay. Mary J, Every Day It Rains was on there. Sweet Tea, right. What's Up Star was on there. Papa Love It, LL. Uh, you know, we had a bunch of joints. I was trying to cover all the bases, right. and that name rings a bell, and I'm not sure if that's why. It's but, all good. It's just the yeah. people I know, and I'm just trying to, okay. you know, remind them that you know you fell through. <laughs> but um, no, nah, the the the, the uh, album was definitely dope. I remember uh, a lot about it. Um, but I want to, uh, you know, you talked about moving to uh, Arista from Def Jam and so on and so forth. I mean, with so much talent behind you and so so many different uh, artists and 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 the, the production. I mean, you, you talked about Brand Nubian Foundation. That's one of my favorite joints. Just so many different uh, angles that you came from. Why is it that you think that today folks are still saying, who is Drew Dixon? Do you think it's because of what took place with uh, Russell? And we're going to get into that particular dynamic yeah. as well or is it is it the, the 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 black woman dynamic what would you say because i mean there's there's no one can say that you were not successful with what it is you brought to the table well thank you for that i think it's both you know i think that as women and in particular as black women it's so hard to just get in the room to get your seat at the table that shirley chisholm talked about to get your folding chair which means so much more now than it did two months ago um yes, you do. <laughs> but to get that folding chair and to get in the room and to be heard and to get a shot for your idea, whether it was the duet, whether it was the ideas I had for the soundtrack, I worked so hard and I expended so much energy just to get that done. I was also surviving Russell Simmons while I was getting that done. I mean, he was harassing me pretty early on. I mean, from the beginning, it was inappropriate con comments and inappropriate attempts at contact that I had to sort of work around. So the energy that I was spending navigating that, but still trying to keep my eye on the prize of getting these records made, sort of left no room for me to think, oh, let me make sure I get the credit. Let me make sure I'm I'm a producer on this record because it was my idea. Let me make sure I'm an A&R person on this record because it was my idea and I moved the reels from one studio to the other for RZA and Puff to work at the same time. You know, it takes a toll. It's just like, you know, I think Toni Morrison said that the part of what racism does is it, you expend energy defending yourself and restating the obvious to people who don't even want to hear you in the first place. They already know, but that energy that you're spending is the energy you're not spending getting paid, getting ahead, pursuing your dream, getting the rest that you need, taking care of yourself, taking care of your people, taking care of your family, taking care of your credits, you know? And so it's very serious, the implications of harassment and so that was just a lot of my bandwidth got absorbed from that and also a lot of my confidence you know a lot of my 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 swag that i was bringing to the table to push to do these things 
I didn't necessarily feel like I belonged because I was also dealing with this other demeaning, perpetual, insulting piece that I think took away from my ability to really take up space in the room. And I guess another thing I would say, I grew up playing basketball. I was a basketball player in elementary school, middle school, and high school, but I was tall in the beginning. And so I was a big girl who would get the rebounds. So I was kind of like, get the rebounds, get the chip shot, pass the ball out, and not like take the pretty shot. Not like, look at me, not bring the ball down. So I was scrappy. I just wanted to do it for the love. And I thought that in the end, people would see me. And what was so devastating about what happened with Russell and then what happened again at Arista with a different person at the end of my career at Arista, which really drove me out of the industry, is the erasure. The fact that I just mm -hmm. got erased. And frankly, if I hadn't said me too, all of these stories would have gone with me to my grave, not just the trauma, but my triumphs. I would have been erased forever. And that really, it's like, it terrifies me to think. And this is why I'm grateful to God and the paths and the doors that open. Cause I didn't even know when I walked through that door to say me too, I was opening up a door to tell my story. That's so much bigger than the story of what happened with Russell Simmons or what happened at Arista after Clive. You know, so I think it's all of that. I think it's racism, sexism. You put it all together, it's erasure. It's lost opportunities. It's lost checks. It's lost credit. It's lost acknowledgement. It happens to all of us, you know, as Black folks. No doubt, no doubt. Um, you know, man, I'm, I'm glad you uh, said that because indeed erasure is real. And indeed it happens to, you know, to women. It happens to, like you said, Black folks in general. Credit is rarely given. I mean, even... You know, nowadays we're so confused. You, you mentioned capitalism earlier. Capitalism will confuse you so much that you'll think that you're thinking. It, it will make you think that you're moving towards uh, some type of victory and you will be oppressing other individuals who look just like you. Yeah. And then folks will be like, well, well, why would they do that? They're black like us or whatever the case is, They're, you know, in naivety. Um, yeah, I, I wanna, uh, we, 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 we keep mentioning uh, the pink elephant in the room you know, uh, Russell, you know, how did you all, how did you come about uh, meeting this guy and talk to us about, you know, what led to this? Because to my understanding, watching the documentary wasn't just a one time thing where, you know, you just bumped into him and, you know, and, and he assaulted you. It was a series of different things that led up to it. To right. my understanding, can you speak on that if you don't mind? Absolutely, yeah. So I met him through a guy named Gary Harris, dearly departed. We lost Gary in January 2018. Um, he was a mentor of mine. He was friends with my aunt, Jaleesa, my mother's first cousin, Aunt Jaleesa, introduced me to Gary when I was answering phones at Warner Brothers Records. And he was at EMI. He was um, actually, he signed D'Angelo maybe like a month or two after I met Gary. And Gary was kind of the guy who, the first a &R person I really met, you know, and who explained to me kind of what it is and how it's done. Somebody who was very devoted to the culture and very well connected. He knew Russell Simmons. He knew, you know, Andre Harrell and Nelson George and Chris Rock. And so hanging out with Gary, I eventually met all of those guys. And I told them whenever I saw them, my name is Drew Dixon. I want to do a &R and the hot new shit is boom, boom, boom. And, you know, I was answering phones. I was receptionist at Empire Management where we represented Gangstar and Premier and J. Rue. And I was like, yo, the hot new shit is come clean by this new cat named J. Rue. And eventually, you know, I think because I grew up knocking on doors, like my name is Rue, another member of the ballot, vote for my dad. I learned how to like have the slogan. And so eventually Russ was like, I know, I know, I know. You're Drew Dixon. You want to do A&R. But you were right. The hot new shit was come clean. So eventually kind of he was, he got to know me and he knew I had ears, right? And so when I got the call that there was an opportunity at Def Jam, it actually came through Russell's ex-girlfriend, Michelle Griffin, who had dated him for a couple of years and actually is now married to Black Thought. So she's now Michelle Trotter. But okay, Michelle okay. is somebody I met hanging out, you know, with Gary and just sort of being around. And Michelle and I got to be friends because we were often the only two women in situations and we were closer in age. And so we would hang out. And when there was an opening at Def Jam, Michelle called me and said, there's an a and job open at Def Jam. And I told Russell Rush that he should hire you. And so I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. So I went to my first interview, I guess it was an interview. It was in his apartment. 
Um, he didn't have an office at Def Jam. People wonder why I would have gone to the apartment. He didn't have an office, you know? So um, Russell's office was, whatever, was wherever he was. It could have been his car. It could have been the Barry Bar. It was wherever he was. And so I went there and he was on the treadmill, like on the top floor. And I was sitting on like a little bench, like in the gym area. And he was on the phone. He was always on the phone. And I got the job. You know, I was like, is this, I mean, he was like, just go to Def Jam, tell them you're working there now. And I went there, Nikki D was at the front desk and that's how I got the job. And so, you know, I was reporting directly to him, but he was never around. So it was very hectic. Like it was hard, you know, it wasn't like a traditional work environment to say the least. And so he would start really by making inappropriate comments on the phone. Like I would be on hold in between like patching him in. Like Slick Rick used to call every day for his one phone call from jail, my number, and then I would patch him in to Russell. So I would have to call Russell's assistant, Simone or Joanne, and then wait for, for Rick to get on the phone. So that was kind of how I did my job a lot. So I'd be on the phone with him and he would say inappropriate things. And then when we would see each other again or talk again, he would apologize. And I would say, it's okay, can we just stay focused, yo? So first of all, I didn't want to piss him off. He's Russell Simmons. I finally have a job at Def Jam reporting to the Russell Simmons, I don't want to seem difficult. I was right. also already told that as a woman, and as a woman who went to Stanford, whose mom was the mayor, I could never survive in this industry. And I had no business making rap records. So I don't want to seem soft. I don't want to complain. I wanted to just like keep it moving, you know, like redirect him, you know? And because he always apologized, I always thought he was sort of inappropriate, but genuinely sorry and not violent, right? So. This is kind of how it went for a while. And then there were situations in person when he was in the building or once when I was in a restaurant with him where he would physically kind of push up on me and I would push him back and be like, yo, money, like chill. Like that's not what we're doing. Like that's not what this is. And he would, again, apologize. He would often leave voice messages on my machine, which I didn't save, but he would leave them on my machine saying, I'm sorry, yo, don't be mad yo, let's focus on this record. Let's focus on this remix. Let's focus on the soundtrack. It's like, yo, for sure. Yo, let's just do that. And I would think like, eventually he's going to get it. He's going to get the message. Like she's really good at her job is what I was hoping he would say. She's very serious and she's focused and she has good ears and good ideas. Let me just redirect that part of my life over here and leave Drew over there. And I kept thinking it's just a matter of time because I didn't understand grooming I don't understand how predators work and predators kick the tires and they see how you react. And I didn't smack him. I didn't tell him to fuck off. I probably should have done both of those things, but I didn't know I could do that, you know? And mm -hmm. I, I was feeling trapped in a way, like I had to make it work. I don't want to get fired, but I didn't want him to continue. And so I was trying to split it down the middle by, not being mean, but being clear that it was a no. And what he saw, I guess, was she's not like, let me see how much farther I can go. I think, I mean, I don't know. I'm not a predator. I don't know how to think, but I think that's what happened. And so I would create strategies to keep the line open because I needed him because he was the only one who let me try the idea to make the interlude a real song or let me work on the soundtrack. So. I didn't want to burn the bridge. So I was trying to, he, he let me sign Capleton and Kylie Ranks, Def Jam's first reggae artist. Um, and so, you know, I thought that he was getting the message that I was good at my job and was going to leave me alone. And I kind of let my guard down because the show soundtrack was doing so well. And I thought I was sort of, I leveled up out of that, that lane where he was doing that. He hadn't done it in a while. And he told me to come upstairs to pick up a demo and he was gonna order me a car. And I was like, okay, this is gonna be quick. And he'd never been like, I don't know. I just didn't know he was violent. I didn't know he was capable of that level of violence. And when I went upstairs to pick up the CD, you know, which I now realized, I didn't even realize until 2017 when I read the stories of the other women in the article in the New York Times with me, I like looked up in December, 2017 and was like, oh shit, there was never a CD, was there? Like it wasn't until I read their stories that the light bulb went off 24 years later, that the CD that I was looking for, that he told me to come upstairs and get when he went into another room and I end up in his bedroom because he just says, he doesn't say go to my bedroom. That would have been a red flag. He says, go down the hall, make a right in the last door. 
and then get the CD out of the CD tray. So I do that. I'm in his room, but I'm not really thinking about that. There's nothing in the tray. And I keep yelling the names of CDs on the shelf. And I'm thinking, you know, this is weird that he can't just tell me the name. And then the next thing I know, he's, you know, rolling up on me. He is naked wearing a condom. And it was a physical fight that I lost. Um, you know, I honestly think about it whenever I do a push up in the gym, that like lack of upper body strength that I needed in that moment, I didn't have it. Um, it was a fight. I said, no, I cried, I screamed, I yelled, I kicked, I did all the things. And then I realized I was trapped and then I froze. I just froze and I essentially complied with my captor because I realized I was alone in this apartment with this guy who was violent and who didn't care. And it was a different version of him than I'd ever seen before. It's kind of like the version of him that we saw in that video that his daughter uploaded where he was yelling. I was like, that is the guy I saw that night. Right, and right. I just froze because it sort of felt like this could get worse if I'm really, he actually said, stop fighting, stop fighting in a very cold voice. And I realized that it was already as bad as it could be, but maybe it could even be worse. And I didn't want to know how worse, how much worse it could be. So I just kind of like flatlined, you know, like a possum. I don't know what to say, like a little, like an animal that plays dead. You know, I feel like that's what happened, you know? And I, you know, and so, you know, I went on and made other records, but of course that changed my level of confidence. And, and so I was just, again, happy to be in the business still, happy to be making records, happy to be contributing to the culture that I love to this day. But I didn't feel like I could stand up for myself, really. I kind of hid behind Clive Davis for the next five years of my career until L.A. Reid took over and then it went sideways again. Wow, wow. Um... First of all, I, um, man, I, I'm, I'm definitely, um, I hate to hear this, number one. Um, I think that for me, a rapist is the, the most, there's certain types of people I don't have con um, tolerance for. Mm. And a rapist is uh, definitely one because it's an individual who really takes control uh, of an individual, robs them of their, you know, of their peace mm -hmm. in every sense of the way. So my apologies, um, I guess, I mean, I don't know if that means anything, but you yes. know, my condolences, so on and so forth. Um, I'm definitely appreciative and I know plenty of other people watching are appreciative that you are sharing your story. I was talking to some folks recently and two things, one, I said that um, I don't know too many black men who haven't been to prison who haven't been arrested. And in comparison, I haven't met too many black women who hasn't had a haven't had a rape story. Yeah. You know, and it is it is insanity. I mean, literally, I mean, just so many women, and it's almost like it's been the norm, you know, to, to hear that type of thing. And and I understand that you all came forward. This was after the the Harvey Weinstein case, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I was gonna take this to my grave. You know, I became a stay-at-home mom. I didn't even tell my kids really the records I made. I used to tell them like in a cab of All I Need came on or, you know, Maria Maria. And then I just stopped. I was like, you know, they don't care. What I have nothing to show for it. So they would even be like, mom, this is depressing. You don't even have Yeezy, stop, you know? So, you know, I, I was gonna take it to my grave. And then when two other women came forward about Russell Simmons, who I'd never met, I've still never met. And I read their stories, my text blew up because I have friends that knew asking me if I'd seen those stories. And so I read the stories and there were things about the stories that were similar to what I experienced. So I knew they weren't lying. I was like, wait, oh my God, this is a pattern, you know? And then I eventually went to the New York Times planning to be off the record, which is why the name of the movie is on the record because it covers my decision going off the record, on the record, from off the record, on the record. And I was filmed because it was actually a mom at my kid's school who I was talking to me too about with, I was talking to me too, talking about her, talking about me too with her at a parent's event. And 
I mentioned in passing, I had a Me Too story. And when I said who it was, she said, I can introduce you to Jody Cantor at the New York Times. And I was like, girl, no, why? I don't want to do that. I'm not a white movie star. That's not for us. You know, I didn't know about Tarana Burke at the time. I just knew kind of the Me Too headlines. And eventually when I saw him release a statement, Russell Simmons released a statement calling the first two women who came forward liars and saying he's incapable of violence. It like made my blood boil. And that's when I went to the New York Times. And the mom who happened to connect me with the New York Times is a documentary filmmaker and her husband was making a Me Too doc and they said, can we follow you? Mm -hmm. And that's how that all started. And so that went from me going off the record to on the record to becoming the main subject of a documentary, partly because I wouldn't sign the release for them to use the footage. They'd been following me for 15 months before I signed the release because I was really afraid of being kicked out of the black table, which is my favorite table in the cafeteria by being seen as like the woman who took down the king of hip hop. I was like, I don't want that. I don't want right. to be that. Right. And then I realized, you know, maybe this was an opportunity to tell the story of the way black women in America have never been saved. And my story is just an example. You know, even with the bluest eye that Toni Morrison talks about, I'm a black woman in America. I have eight black great grandparents. I'm not mixed. I don't have a white parent who's gonna jump out with a get out of jail free card. I may look like I do, I don't, okay? And so I wanted to talk about that. And I was talking about that in the interviews they were doing with me for the film and they chose to shift the focus of the film to that. And that's really why I was like, okay, I didn't see the footage before I signed the release, but I could feel that they were hearing me. And so I signed it. And I said, you know, I really would feel more comfortable if they were a black executive producer and that's how Oprah got involved. And then she left 10 days before the movie came out at Sundance, which was actually one of the most terrifying things I ever experienced, which sounds crazy, but it really is because it was like my worst nightmare um, to be out there on my own with the woman who I feel like is maybe one of the strongest, certainly one of the most powerful black women in the world. Um, but you know- well, Let's talk about that because I mean, you mentioned Oprah in passing, like Oprah was just walking down the street one day and I am old and I'm down with the program. You said it all nonchalant, like, you know what I mean? Like it's one of the homies from down the block. Um, how did Oprah get involved and, and how did she exit? Because, you know, I, I saw some things on that and I'm glad that you brought it up. But, you know, let, let's talk about that because Oprah's a woman, of course. Oprah's yeah. a black woman. Survivor. Oprah has power. So, yeah. Yeah. What happened with that? How right. did she get down? So, you know, what happened is, you know, and I didn't know a lot of this until after the fact, because I was very, they were very church and state about survivor producer. I wasn't involved in the making of the film. They filmed me. I introduced them to some people like Daddy O and other people that could, you know, speak to my career and my story. But I didn't, you know, have anything to do with the, the behind the scenes of making the movie. But what I found out after, you know, when it all kind of, fell apart in January of 2020, right before the movie was supposed to premiere at Sundance, is that they approached her in Sun at Sundance the year before, they approached one of her producers. I think the woman's name was Terry, who ran Harpo. Maybe she still does. And she saw footage of the documentary and loved it and shared it with Oprah, who signed on because Oprah had a deal with Apple TV. And Oprah signed on as the executive producer of On the Record I think it was maybe June, April, May, June of 2019. I think they told me about it in June. And um, so she became the executive producer of On the Record and she was gonna do, I think two other films with the same directors about different settings where Me Too happens. You know, whether it was, I think it was religious institutions and it was also like, I don't know, I'm not sure, but this one was focusing on black women with the Russell Simmons survivors kind of at the center. and. Um, so she signed on in June of 2019, as far as I know, and she was very involved. You know, they continued filming us. And I was told there were a few times where like, there was something that I said that she liked, but there was like a truck in the background. So they needed me to like go in my closet, which was my soundproof room and say it again, just cause it was like audio was messed up, things like that. So I knew from those like, you know, notes that they were sending me that she was listening and she was giving feedback. And, um, and then I believe Harpo submitted on the record to Sundance and it was accepted. And she was very proud of it. As far as I know, Harpo did a press release in early December saying that they were so proud to be involved with this 
untitled Me Too documentary, which is what it was called at the time. And then Sundance listed the films that they were showing in the festival in December. And even though this was still called an untitled Me Too documentary, somebody accidentally uploaded a still image of me from the film in one of the press releases. And it was a picture of me literally reading the New York Times article with like Russell's picture on the front, right? And so that's how it got sort of the cat got out of the bag before Sundance. And I know, and it's publicly reported now that Russell was livid. He posted an open letter to her on Instagram. 50 Cent also posted an open letter to Oprah on Instagram calling her a sellout. There was a lot of pressure on her to back out. It was a really painful time for me um, that I won't even get into. I can't even get into the details of it, but it was really hard. And I just didn't think she was going to cave. I just didn't think she would. And eventually she did back out on January 10th at around 6 p.m. I know this because two other survivors of Russell Simmons and I had just finished an interview for CBS This Morning with Michelle Miller right before she backed out. And then we walked off the set and she backed out that night. And it was just devastating. And um, she said she backed out for creative reasons. Ava DuVernay is even quoted in a New York Times article where she says she watched the film with Oprah and Mm -hmm. advised her to, I guess, back out for... I think Ava said she thought it didn't represent hip hop well. It was confusing. It's still very confusing to me. I'm going to take her at her word because I don't know her. I've never met Oprah Winfrey. It was really hurtful. It felt like a betrayal, even though I don't know her, but I thought she was going to be our kind of protector. And, you know, it felt kind of like the matriarch was succumbing to the patriarchy. But that's my own stuff that I've had to work out in therapy, which is a whole separate issue. And um, so, but, you know, I do believe that God's, you know, rejection is God's protection. And as a result of her backing out, I had to find my voice and I had to stand up for the film because I think Sundance was considering canceling the screening because if Oprah had problems with the film, then maybe they shouldn't screen the film. And I personally said, well, I'm a black woman and I'm a survivor and I'm in this film and I believe it's important. I think it should be seen. And I think, Maybe somebody else can distribute it. Why does it have to just be Oprah and just be Apple? And that's really how I found my voice. And I had to sort of speak up and out in a way that was terrifying for me at the time. But that's the voice that I used when I became part of this amazing coalition of survivors that fought for the Adult Survivors Act in New York. And we helped to get it passed. It's what E. Jean Carroll used to sue Donald Trump, literally the legislation that I helped to get passed. I was asked by the governor to give a speech when she signed the bill for the Adult Survivors Act. So I never would have become an activist beyond just saying my story timidly if Oprah hadn't backed out. So I thank her in some ways for helping me to find my voice. And I also want to say as a Black woman, I do not want her to become the villain in this story. She is a Black woman in America for all of her money, you know, it's not easy. And I don't want to make her the focus because really the focus should be on what happened to all of the Russell Simmons survivors and what happens to all of these victims who are black women, black girls, black people, black bodies in America. And I just, you know, so I've sort of made my peace with it. So, so would it be inappropriate for me today on this show to say, fuck Oprah, Ava, uh, 50 and Russell? Would that be uh, inappropriate? Just, just asking, you know. I mean, you know, from your lips to God's ears, I'm gonna just let you say what you want to say. I'm, I yeah. hear you. <laughs> I, I mean, but, but you did say Ava. It was quoted in the New York Times. She was. She she basically trashed the film in the New York Times before. And she said it wasn't hip hop. She said so, it didn't represent hip hop, and it was sort of like A. That's not what the movie is about. B. Dr. Joan Morgan and Kieran Mayo, who have been writing about hip hop since the beginning, are in this film. So, you know, I mean, you know, I don't know. It is what it is. I'm trying to process, but. Mm. <laughs> no, no, that, 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 that's real wild. But I think that, you know, uh, the audience should take note because, you know, when you have someone like, and I'm, I'm going to say Ava since she was quoted. Yeah. You know, taking responsibility 
you know, I mean, how do you support that particular work and that energy? Um, I, I want to, you mentioned earlier, you said you were tall and you talked about the whole basketball thing. I remember in the documentary, uh, you, you, you quoted um, Lear Cohen saying something. He said, and, I don't want to deal with any of Russell's tall, skinny bitches, which I guess was like code for models. Right. But I wasn't a model. I wore Tim's. I wore baggy jeans. I wore baby fat T-shirts because I got them for free. <laughs> and right. Tim's and baggy jeans. And I, I had glasses half the time. I couldn't afford my contact lens solution. <laughs> so I didn't see myself that way. And it was confusing to me that they were grouping me in with them. And frankly, I thought, okay, fine. Maybe they see me that way at the door. But when they see how I work and what I do and what my work ethic is, they're going to get that I'm not here for that. You know, and it didn't matter. So what, what do you think he meant by that when you say one of Russell's tall, skinny bitches? I'm just saying, like, you know, since we talk about on the record, I mean, what 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 does that mean for folks who, who need to be walked with their hands I held? I think that Lior was implying, you know, I mean, frankly, Julie Greenwald, who's the chairman of Atlantic Records now, one of the most powerful women in the music industry, was a vice president of marketing at Def Jam and told me that if I wanted to get ahead at Def Jam, I should come to the Hamptons and stay in the house with her and Lior and Russell and bring my knee pads. And I remember thinking, does he have a volleyball court? Because I played volleyball in high school too. And I was like, oh, oh, is that what she's saying? And keep in mind, this is a white woman. Right. Lior and Julie are white, telling yes. me, a black woman, the way I'm supposed to get ahead in this business is to come to the Hamptons and get on my knees. <sighs> and so, yeah, they thought that I was going to be part of Russell's harem. And I guess he had a harem. And anybody that was in his harem consensually, God bless them. That is between them and Russell. And I don't begrudge anybody their choices. But I had no interest in him in any way other than being my boss and letting me make records and do my job. Zero. Right. Right. And so that was clear. But they were trying to put me in that box and I wasn't in that box. I had no interest in being in that box. I didn't go to the Hamptons ever. I went one time when I was at Def Jam in a group on a helicopter with Lior Cohen and that whole a &R department. And we went out together on a chopper and we landed and we stayed in an inn and we did an a &R meeting at the house where Russell was floating around an inner tube in the pool while we were at the table by the pool. And I was still fighting for the duet at that point. And I went back with them. I stayed in the inn with my colleagues that night. I had no interest in any type of that aspect of his life or any type of relationship with him like that, ever. And so it was like crazy. But that's what Lior Cohen was implying, that I was like one of his model chicks in his harem. And it was just like, you know, I mean, like just erased who I am and what I do and what I was bringing to the table. That's that's that that's wild. Just this whole story, especially with uh Julie Greenwall. I mean, that that's like, yeah, man. I mean, and, and I mean, you know, I mean, you 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 were pretty nice because you know I could see her getting that. That sounds like a black eye. You know what I'm saying? It sounds like, uh, you know, like like it, it was totally, man. I mean, they felt real comfortable, and, I, and I, even comfortable. with, yeah, even with Larry Cohen, I'm I'm just like. You know, when did he get this? I mean, I know he's a, a an, an Israeli gentleman. Yeah. When did he get so comfortable talking to not just black women, but just black people, period? I noticed that, you know, they really never gave a fuck. And it's just like, is this, yeah, so, so is this the type say of About how they were given license to move around us and talk around us by their boy. Right. And think about all the money they've made on our culture and our people. You know, when you talked earlier, I'm sorry, I'm jumping around, but you talked about how there are very few black men that haven't spent time time behind bars and there are very few black women that haven't been raped or violated in some way. It's literally an echo of, I'm gonna go back to the transatlantic slave trade and that condemned cell where our brothers were locked up to die and where all of the women who were actually 15, so they were girls, were raped systematically. We are still, we are reenacting that today. And I'm not blaming us because this is a dynamic that was put in place hundreds of years ago. But what is heartbreaking is when we are parties to it, when we yeah. have music that becomes the soundtrack of the language that was used to, to rationalize the sexual abuse of black women and girls. And when we have language that 
sort of supports this notion that we're violent and, and we don't have, you know, we somehow deserve this, this brutality or even the magic is sort of an insult. Like we can just take it and just take it and take it. Black girl magic. I'm not magic. I'm a human being. We are human beings who bleed real blood and cry real tears. And, you know, we are still replaying that cell. Our brothers are in the cell and our girls are getting violated. Rinse, repeat for hundreds of years. And we have to break the cycle for us, not just for me or victims of Russell Simmons or victims of anybody in particular, for the next generation of black men and women and all gender identities of black people, we have to break the cycle because we're going to lose the next Sherry Cher, who's a victim of Russell Simmons. We're going to lose yeah. the next generation of women and we're going to lose the next Russell Simmons, the next Bill Cosby, the next R. Kelly too. You know, we don't need to lose the next generation of them. What a loss. The next Bombada. I don't want to lose him to this cycle. Let's save all of us by just saying no more. You know, and I don't care if white folks get away with it. That's one of the big things. Well, what about Harvey? And what about Trump? And what about, well, we season our food. We clap when we clap. We don't follow them how they clap. We clap we, on the downbeat and we season our food. So we can also do this differently because we have more to lose. That's why I care so much. I cared about black culture when I started making rap records and I care about black culture as a Me Too activist. I care about us. Hey, out, out of respect for your time, you know, I know you got to run. I got, uh, you know, two small questions. If you don't okay, mind, we can squeeze sure. them in in the next eight minutes or less. Okay. Um, the, the first question is um, um, after the, the documentary dropped and it's still on HBO Max, I believe. Um, so for folks who haven't checked it out, go check out on the record on HBO Max. I think you'll be uh, you know, happy that you did and then come back and listen to this again. And you'll see the importance of, of, of that particular uh, story. I wanna ask you after that documentary dropped, what was the, uh, you know, what was the feedback? Was it positive? Was it love or, you know, I mean, let, let's hear about that. It was a mix. You know, it was a lot of negative blowback at first, like going into it because of the sort of Russell Simmons, 50 Cent, Oprah, Ava of it all, right? That momentum was really brutal. Um, and it, 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 you know, it definitely created a wave that was very painful. But as people started to see it, there was also this other wave of survivors who related to it, who connected with it. I mean, my DMs blew up with people telling me heartbreaking stories. You know, I feel like black women in particular were reaching out to me, but black survivors in general and survivors of all races and gender identities. And again, I always wanna say this, there's no pain Olympics here. I hold space in my heart for every single survivor of sexual violence, period. Okay, and so the floodgates opened and a lot of people told me how much it meant to them. It was also overwhelming and I had to process my trauma. So I had buried it for 24 years and it was kind of like the monster under the bed that I never looked at. And all of a sudden the monster was rolling around at my son's little league game when a woman would come up to me in tears or in a restaurant with my kids and the waitress would break into tears, which was very moving, but also hard for me because suddenly I had to sort of be a rape victim. And I kind of had just, guarded that part of my identity. And that's why I always say, I will always be a victim and a survivor. Every day that I wake up, I'm a survivor. We call ourselves survivors because not all victims do. I want to hold space for that. But I am always going to be a victim because I was always, I'm always going to carry this pain. And I'm not trying to just, I, I realized I had tried to kind of discard the, the loser who what, went upstairs and, and got ambushed or the loser who didn't know how to deal with it when it happened again at Arista. And I had to have compassion for her and realize that running off to business school and becoming a mom and a wife and sort of looking like I was all good didn't really honor that part of me, that girl, you know. And by going back and holding the wounded part of myself, I started to heal. But I'm going to be honest, I went backwards. There was a lot of breaking down and shame that I was going through behind the scenes as I was doing these Zooms and saying all the things. So, you know, I feel like I'm just starting to put myself back together again. And it's been about six years since I said me too. It's been three years 
since the documentary came out and I'm just getting to the other side of it. No doubt. No doubt. No, and we definitely appreciate, uh, you know, you coming forth. Uh, I got one more question that one of my partners, uh, Dr. Ball here, you know, wanted me to ask in regards to the uh, documentary Ladies First. Did you share your story on that particular documentary and was it cut or what was the situation on that? Because it seemed like you kind of, you touched on, uh, from what I can recall, you talked about the situation in regards to um, Beth and Mary, how that came about. But, um, you know, we didn't hear anything about the survival aspect. aspect. Um, so can you uh, share that with us all? It's hard, you know, to, to remember exactly, you know, what I said in the interview. It was April 2022 when they interviewed me, when Dream interviewed me. And I'm so grateful to Dream Hampton. Can we please shout out that okay. warrior? Oh, it's my God. Okay. Fearless. Whoa. Um, I do believe I told the story when the cameras were rolling, if memory serves. And I just don't think it made it into the final cut, maybe because I've told the story so many times in other settings. And one thing I do appreciate is that it did give me an opportunity to be seen and heard as somebody who could talk about stuff other than that, like even having me weigh in on the economics of record deals. But yeah. I don't know, but I'm pretty sure I'm, I told the story when the cameras were rolling, but I would have to defer to Dream on that because she would remember better than I do. Yeah. She's curious. Um, we appreciate you coming on, uh, wow. Drew. And, um, you know, taking time out your busy day. Looking forward to you coming back because you will be back. All right. I will be. For sure. <laughs> We oh, definitely sure. appreciate you. Stay strong. Uh, and we, we appreciate the work that you've been giving us. All right. Thank you so Down much. Point. You no too. Doubt. No doubt. All right. Checking out, uh, this was Drew Dixon from the industry, from everywhere. You know what I mean? And she laid it out for you here today on RSTV. Um, we're hoping that you all will share this. Go back and watch the uh, Dream Ham Hampton interview we did. We have another uh, guest coming up. Not today. But real soon, because we've been doing a lot around uh, this old lady's first piece. We have another individual. I'm not even going to tell you a name just yet, but just know to stick around. We appreciate what it is that you all are doing and checking us out and supporting us. So, um, you know, keep up the good work and we'll see you soon. This is RSTV. And, you know, till next time, on the right side of barricades. Salute. Ancestor, ancestor, take my hand, ancestor, lead me on, ancestor, let me stand, ancestor, I get tired, ancestor, I get weak, I get weak, my nose, I get warm, ancestor, through the storm, ancestor, through the night, ancestor, lead me on, ancestor, through the light, ancestor, take my hand. Ancestors and lead me on uh -huh. in my way, my way grows drip. Ancestor, please linger near when my life is all almost gone. Hear my cry, hear my call. Sisters and